Coming up next on Third Down Chirp, the Bronze Stock stays in DeKalb. We'll take a look back at the game against Northern Illinois, hand out some midterm grades, and break down this weekend's homecoming game as the Broncos come into Schumann Stadium. All that and more coming up. Third Down Chirp starts right now. Ball State Sports Link's third down chirp is delivered by Papa John's. Better ingredients, better pizza. Visit PapaJohns.com today for more info. Hello and welcome into this week's episode of Third Down Chirp delivered by Papa John's. I'm your host, Chris Rankle, and as always, I'm joined by Pat Boylan and Timmy Fogarty. And for the second week in a row, a heartbreaking loss, but that's life in the Mac. Five of the six games Ball State's played so far have gone right down to the wire. They're three and three. They probably could be five and one. Probably could be one and five. Three and three seems pretty fair. Yeah, guys, the Cardinals open up. Mac played, dropped their first two, and in just heartbreaking fashion. So hopefully, look forward to rebound this week, homecoming week. But before we move on to homecoming week, let's take a look back at the heartbreaking loss against Northern Illinois on a pink day. A pretty good student crowd at that as well. And early on, it looked like the Ball State offense was clicking. Uh, keep winning to Willie Sneed. Stop me when you've heard this one before. Another classic hookup, but Chris, I will stop you because this play would not count. Holding in the backfield wipes it out. A huge momentum changer. And Northern Illinois would snap the momentum right back. Jordan Lynch, 29-yard touchdown run untouched. Lynch has the body of a linebacker, but plays quarterback so tough to stop. Horatio Banks, third and one from the goal line. He would be stuffed. This would be the marquee of the game. Missed opportunities in Northern Illinois. Leighton Settle takes it in from one yard out. He wasn't stuffed. Uh, Northern in control early, and the miscues would continue. Keith Wenning can't find Jamil Smith. They would get a Steven Schott field goal out of it, and then Third quarter, it looks like the Cardinal offense is starting to wake up. Willie Sneed, no holding on this one. This play called brilliant to Northern Illinois, not ready for the snap, so Ball State runs that quick screen play. Willie Sneed, very patient, pays off for him. And then Keith Wenning from one yard out. Ball State starting to pull away. 23-14 lead, but the fourth quarter would be a different story. Steven Schott would miss two field goals. This one just wide right, and then Northern Illinois not going away. Here's Lynch through the air this time to Akeem Daniels. That's going to be a 54-yard touchdown pass all the way, almost untouched. Northern comes all the way back in the fourth quarter. They take the lead on that one, and they would go on to win it. So the Bronze Stock stays in DeKalb four years in a row. Ball State has lost to Northern Illinois. As there you see the final score, 35-23. to But despite another loss, another strong performance from Keith Wining. But 71 passes for Keith. That breaks his personal high by 19. It's also a Cardinal record. 71 attempts, an eye-popping stat from winning. But on the other side, Jordan Lynch as a quarterback, 29 carries. Just remarkable. Now, usually our player of the game honors go to an offensive player. But it, in this game, it really was the defense that stepped up and played very well. Those 35 points, a little misleading. The offense really struggling. But who do you give your player of the game honors to? Mine is going to be an offensive player. It's going to be Jamil Smith. And he's a guy who came in. You know, Willie Sneed had kind of taken that role as the number one go-to guy, but Jamil shows he's pretty, he's still a pretty darn solid target out there. 14 catches, 146 yards, but most importantly was there every time Keith needed him in big situations. He's so quick, he's so fast, so tough to stop, and made three or four plays in this game that I don't think any other Cardinal and very other few players in the MAC are capable of making. Pat, I'm going to go on the other side of the ball, and I'm going to go with a guy we just continue to talk about, Jonathan Newsom. He had two sacks, eight tackles on the day, but really the biggest thing was he just disrupted the Husky offense just pretty much the entire game. And they ran a lot of plays away from him, so he wasn't able to get in on a lot of tackles. Most of his eight tackles were from behind, grabbing the guys by their ankles and stuff. So, I mean, Jonathan Newsom really made some noise, got two more sacks, kind of like a just terrorizing offenses. So, a big day from Newsom. And easy to forget that he didn't play the first two games of the season. Here After the game, here's Coach Lumbo. And he was very emotional after the game that had a silver lining he was able to find that he said the defense really was able to give them the victory. Here is Coach Lembo. 
Well, we're playing real competitive football, but there's no such thing as a good loss, and, and we're obviously very disappointed. I thought our defense played with great effort today, got a bunch of stops on third down, got us some turnovers, got some stops on fourth down, and certainly kept us in the game and, and gave us a good chance to win the game. We need to execute better on offense. We need to make our field goals. We had some penalties that really hurt us today. And when you're playing against a great football team like Northern, there's going to be very little margin for error. So you got to come out of the red zone with touchdowns. You certainly got to come out of the red zone with points. You can't turn it over. And you can't put yourself off schedule with penalties. If we play with this kind of effort and intensity for the next six weeks, we're going to be just fine. And uh, we've got another huge challenge with a Western team coming in here next week. Uh, but I hope that our defense can build off of what they did today. Again, uh, they gave us a chance to win the game. Back play rolling on this weekend, and some of the contenders starting to separate themselves from the rest of the pack as we take a look around the MAC presented by Fox College Sports. Starting in the MAC East, and really a lot of crossover games in this one, Ohio for the second week in a row barely escapes, only beating Buffalo 38-31. And now questions start to arise. Are the Bobcats for real? Is that 6-0 record for real? you got to remember, Kent State, their competition in that division beat Buffalo by 16. Western Michigan wins big over UMass without Alex Carter, 52-14. Yeah, without Alex Carter, but Tyler Van Tuvergen fills in and gets a big win for the Broncos, puts up 52 points. Kent State rolling right now, 41-14. It looks like that Kent State team is a lot better than we originally thought. You're exactly right, Chris. I think Kent State's going to surprise a lot of teams in this conference, and they're already starting to do that. Eastern Michigan obviously off to a tough start, but Kent State, they play very good defense, and they've shown they've got the playmakers. Guys like Dree Archer can move the football, and when they get hot, they're very tough to stop. I think they're legit competition for that Mackey's division. Bowling Green with a big win over Akron, 24-10. Guys, Akron just continues to struggle. The Zips can't get anything going offensively, and they can't really stop anyone defensively. And the Falcons show it right here. Put up 24, and they win by two scores. And our one out-of-conference game, Miami, Ohio, falling to Cincinnati 52-14 in the Battle of Southern Ohio. The Red Hawks just couldn't do anything against that Bearcat team. This Miami team is pretty tough to figure out so far this year. They played a lot of good teams. They've already played Boise. Obviously, Cincinnati, another BCS-level opponent. They got crushed in this game. But they're always tough to judge when you've got a quarterback that's as good as Dysert. You never know. And on the Mac East side of things, or Mac West side of things, only one uh, strictly Mac West game. That's Toledo coming off the top of Central Michigan, 50 to 35, a game that really went back and forth. Toledo's arguably one of the best teams in the MAC this season. You know, year in and year out, they produce good quarterbacks. They have a great coaching staff, and then Central Michigan—that's a team that. I personally can't get a read on. I mean, one week they'll look tremendous. The next week they'll, you know, really struggle. But Toledo has no problem here. Puts up 50 points and beats the Chippewas. As we take an updated look at our standings, as I said, some uh, teams starting to separate from the pack. Pat, you know, we were a little questionable on some teams. Who do you see as an underdog and really see as maybe a little overrated? Well, first, if you're Ball State, you look at that East division. You've played the top team in the East and you played the number two team in the West. So while you're one and two and you're sitting a little further down, you at least have to remember the fact that the two teams you played are a combined 5-0. and But if the Cardinals are looking for, Mac, for the MAC West title, I think – uh, that they, I think that they can't lose anymore. I think they have to stay at that two loss. Well, and also, guys, you said you know the number one team in the MAC East. They lost on a last-second field goal in the MAC West against Northern Illinois. Statistically, they controlled throughout the entire game. So Ball State's one and two, but has really played better than that. And uh, luckily, they have six more games to play before the end of the season. And this MAC, as we said before, anything can happen. Win one week, lost the next. Uh, last year, we were just thrown for circles, teams beating teams that beat other teams. It's, it's a mess. It's the MAC. What can you do? And, of course, six games left means it's halfway through the season. It seems like just yesterday we were playing Eastern Michigan to start the season off, it. but we're halfway, so we're going to go a little Ball State professor right now and hand out some midterm grades. So, Pat, a team that's looked really good sometimes and really bad at others, what's your midterm grade? For the offense, I think you have to give it an A. Winning's played very good. The running backs, for the most part, have played very good. Zane Fakes, even at tight end, he's had a great year so far. 
Uh, the offensive line's been tremendous. I think you have to give the offense an A. Now, the defense, I'm going to give a C-. And they played good at times. They played well enough to win at times. Coach Lembo said against Northern Illinois, this defense played good enough to win the football game. You said it earlier, Chris. That 35 points, not really indicative of uh, the, the way the defense played. It was definitely better. However, the fourth quarter defense, you have to give a straight F to. It's been very, very bad, and it's been the reason why the Cardinals, who typically are used to winning games late down the stretch, have lost the last couple. And if it wasn't for the offense making two great drives late in the game, the defense in the fourth quarter would have blown four of their six games. I agree with you 100%, Pat. One of the things I'm going to br uh, break down is just the first four games compared to the last two. The first four games, they start three and one, which they could have easily started one and three. I mean, you knock off a Big Ten opponent, and then you knock off a Big East opponent. It's the highest of highs for this Cardinal team. But then the next week, you start Mac playing Kent State, a team that you statistically looked like you should beat them. But now Kent State's starting to prove, you know, they're better than most people thought. They lose that on a last-second field goal. And then the last game, you lose to Northern Illinois. And, Pat, I agree with you. As far as finishing and everything, and in the fourth quarter, you have to give an F to that. But as far as grades go, the first four games, I'll give them an A. They looked good in those games. They pulled off some big wins, got a lot of confidence. The last two games, I'm going to go with a C minus just because the fourth quarters have been just an absolute mess for this Cardinal team. And then you go special teams. I think overall, not counting last game with Steven Schott, but overall special teams wise, you got Scott Cavando, who's been a great punter this season. Steven Schott and the field goals have also been great. I think special teams, I'm going to give an A minus to the defense. I'll give them a B just because, you know, overall the secondary has struggled, but you know, the guys like Tony Martin and those guys have really picked it up for the defense. So I'm going to give them a B. So we have six games left, and three and three really, like we've said, we've seen highs, we've seen lows, mm -hmm. we've seen even some between. Three and three record doesn't really tell you where this season could go. So, Pat, where do you think this season's going to go? Well, it's, it, it's really tough to tell just because you've played six games so far, and five have come right down to the wire, and it all comes down to winning those games in the clutch moments. And it's something that Coach Lembo, they're still uh, six and two in games decided by four points or less. So you like the Cardinals' odds in those situations, but you don't necessarily like the odds if the defenses are going to continue to play that way. I mean, really, realistically, the offense had to put together two incredible drives against Indiana, against South Florida, where the Cardinals would be 1-5 and five right now, which is astonishing to think about, considering they've done a lot of good things this year. The good news is, though, they played two of their toughest MAC opponents already. They've got some easier ones coming up. Uh, you got Western with their backup quarterback. You've got Central coming up, who is very unpredictable. You've got some of your easier MAC games. None of them are easy by any stretch, but easier. I don't think the bowl picture is out of the question at all. I don't even think the MAC title game is out of the question at all, but they've definitely got to start getting it into gear now. Well, I think this offense has the skill to make a bowl game, and I think they will make a bowl game. I think they could go eight and four, but going eight and four, guys, that means that they're going to have to beat. Uh, they have to win two out of the three between Western Michigan, Toledo, and Ohio. Three very good teams in the MAC, especially Toledo and Ohio. I mean, so they could. I think they could go eight and four, but they're going to have their defense is really going to have to pick it up because that's something that we just keep preaching week in and week out. They've really struggled in that. The secondary giving up over 300 yards a game through the air and everything. So. If they can win two out of those three big games, I think they can go to Central Michigan and beat Central, and I think they can win the game at Ar uh, Army in here in a few weeks as well. So I don't think that an 8-4 and four record is out of the picture at all. It should be an entertaining last six games to go, and anything can happen, so you're going to have to stay tuned to Third John Chirp and Ball State Sports Link just for the latest on what's happening with football. And, and with this weekend, the homecoming game, Ball State trying to end a two-game losing streak. They're also trying to end a three-game losing streak on homecoming games. The three of us sitting at this desk, we have not seen a homecoming win since we've been at Ball State. We're all seniors. Guys, I'm hoping that they're going to get one. Oh. We caught up with several players after practice to ask them about this weekend's game. Just got to get better every day. Like I uh, said, we out here getting practice getting better every day. A lot of a lot of DBs, a lot of cover, cover covers that we see every week um, fly to the ball and they're fast, so it's just going to be a tough challenge. Just come out here ready to work every day. Uh, it's, we're going to have adversity throughout the season. We're, we hit it right now, so we just got to beat, beat, uh, beat through this adversity. I thought we did pretty good uh, in the beginning uh, for the first, uh, for, to, to the halftime. I don't think the scoreboard shows how good our defense was last game. I think our, def our pass rush is getting better each week. They got the backup quarterback in there now. I think four, 14 is hurt. Number four is real dangerous. He's a freshman receiver. Pretty good. So now we just got to focus on stopping the pass, stopping him. We should be good. 
as there you hear those two guys, uh, Nathan Alley and Jamil Smith, two guys who've played very well, and they know what's at stake with this game this weekend. No, they absolutely do. I mean, those guys, you know, they've been there. They've done, you know, been in a lot of game action. Ali, not necessarily old, but he's played pretty much from the get-go. I mean, you talk about it. You want to get that, that homecoming victory. We think we want it bad. Oh. Th those guys, those guys want it a lot worse. And I think that Coach Limbo, that's something he's going to really preach this week is how hungry are you? You know, how hungry are you for the victory to come out? You lost your last two games after such a great start. So I really think this team could come out with a fire. And, guys, something we noticed, you know, being at the game towards that second half, the end of that game, Coach Bateman was down on the field, and we noticed there was a huge difference in the intensity with the defense and how pumped they were the, throughout the entire second half. Now they struggled in the fourth quarter, which seems to you know be a ritual for this defense, but with Coach Bateman on the field uh, now, I wonder if they do that again because they had so much intensity. It should be a great game as we take a look at these two teams in our head-to-head -head segment and starting off with the quarterbacks, an interesting matchup. Alex Carter out with a hand injury. We do not think he's going to play. In fact, Coach Cubitt said this week he just got that pin out of his hand yesterday, so it doesn't look like he's going to play, but Tyler Van Tubergen has been just as good, if not better, than Carter this year. Yeah, he, he has been very good, Chris, and he's he, he might be a little bit of a drop-off just because of all the things that Carter brings on the team, but Van Tubergen last week, uh, he, he was a Manning nominee for one of the top quarterbacks in the nation, so at least from that last week's performance, so you know that he can get it done. It's a little bit of a drop-off, but not much. Yeah, and on the Ball State side, guys, the running back's not playing great as of late, but Keith Winning, I mean, look at those stats. Almost 1,800 yards, just under 300 yards a game, 11 TDs and just four picks. And on the running back side of things, uh, something that Western Michigan has struggled with, but they're, gonna, they're going to the running game more with an inexperienced quarterback. And Jawan Edwards, after a monstrous start, he's really kind of dropped off. For Brian Fields in this Western Michigan team, they've never really had a premier running back or a running back that you know really is even the top half of the MAC. They've traditionally been a throwing team, a team that struggles to run. That was the case even last year when Ball State played him. But with Van Tubergen in, they've tried to put more an emphasis on running the football, and so far it's been so good uh, for this Western team. Brian Fields is not the only running back. They've got two or three that'll carry the ball. But you see, in terms of yards per carry, Brian Fields pretty darn good at six and a half. And Fields a great running back, Pat. But Jawan Edwards, I mean, we saw what he's capable. of through those first games. He's so powerful, and this season he's so explosive. You know, just under 90 yards uh, rushing on the season per game. So he, he can go out there and he can ball. So really look for him this weekend to turn it around. Homecoming, big crowd, a lot of emotion. Hopefully the running backs can pick it up. Also a point to make about the running backs. Western uses the running backs a lot in the passing game, so the rushing stat's a little not as good as you would think, but the receiving yards, they are very valuable in their screen game. And looking at the receivers, though, Two guys, very young. They're from the same hometown, and they're putting up monster numbers. Yeah, it's too bad Ball State couldn't have gotten this kid to follow with Willie Sneed over here to the Cardinals. But Jamie Wilson comes in as a freshman. He's trying to replace Jordan White, who was one of the best receivers in MAC history. And at least from Wilson's perspective, you know, they haven't as a team been able to really replace him. He, they haven't had a receiver that can do the things, obviously, uh, uh, that – Jordan could do, but Wilson's done a good job filling it. Just a freshman, 51 catches. I mean, you look at those stats in general, they're all about the same. Yeah, exactly. It's like scary how similar those stats are, but Willie Sneed, I mean, this guy, we've almost got just used to him going out and putting up at least 100 yards and a touchdown every single game. Where, as, as you know, Ball State football fans, we're almost getting spoiled because we're so used to him putting up monster numbers, but yeah, 47 receptions and five TDs through six games this year. Great start on the season for Willie Sneed. And defensively, Ball State started to look a lot better last game. They still gave up 35 points, but Western Michigan has been so good on defense, especially for a max school. They are ranked in the top 25 of sacks nationally. There you see with 17. Yeah, the sacks is the big thing with them. They do give up the big play on occasion. This is a defense that Ball State should be able to move the football against, but that offensive line, it's going to get a test. A great D-line versus a great O-line headed into this week. One of the main reasons I think it could be a high-scoring game is the opponent, their defensive red zone percentage. Western Michigan, their de uh, offenses score against them in the red zone almost 90% of the time. Ball State, a 100% of the time on the season, people have scored against them inside the red zone. So this one just has high scoring written all over it. It should be a great game. And the past two weeks have been good games. Maybe a little bitter if you're a Ball State fan like we are, but... Coach Lembo said after the Northern game, you hate to say moral victory, but you can also take a little bit of a silver lining out of any loss, and this Northern game provided a lot of them. 
Well, it, it, there were some definite positives in this Northern Illinois game. I mean, Ball State statistically uh, was the better football team for about three and a half quarters. But for me, I'm not a big silver lining guy. I'm not a big good losses guy. And Coach Lembo said that there's no such thing as a good loss. And if there was such thing in a good, as a good loss, I would have hoped it was two weeks ago against Kent State because Ball State in that game statistically offensively was tremendous. The defense didn't show up. You would have hoped that was a case of, okay, that's our wake-up call. We can't win like this every week. But the defense definitely was better. It definitely was, imp was improved. It definitely had more intensity. But in the end, still gave up those fourth-quarter points that they've been doing all year. And 35 is still, while not a huge MAC number, it's still a lot of points to give up. One of the positives, guys, was just their ability to actually move the football. I mean, it, statistically, they have moved the ball very well in their games this year. It's just finishing on plays and finishing it inside the red zone. And those are things that Coach Limbo really preaches is the little things. I mean, turnovers and things like that. You saw last week, Juwan Edwards, they're really moving the football, and Edwards fumbles the ball. Last year, he had zero fumbles. This year, he already has three. So it's the little things that you can take out of this that, Coach, that really bothers Coach Limbo, the interceptions in key situations, not uh, converting on third and goal from the three yard line or from the two yard line excuse me from last week having the ball inside the 10 three different times and only getting six points those are the small things that they really need to capitalize on and one of the major bright spots in the past two weeks even though they haven't won has been quarterbacks Keith Wenning's performance uh, just some numbers to throw out seven touchdowns only two interceptions 879 yards and oh by the way he's now fourth all-time passing on the Ball State career list Still only a junior, and he's three yards away from moving into third place, passing Talmadge Hill. To say the least, Pat, he's been dominant. We've had this conversation in our many car trips. If you could pick one player in the MAC right now to start a team with, you probably go Keith. Well, Keith Winning has two things that are huge. He has poise and he has accuracy. If you're a coach, you take those two things before anything. And we talked to this week the man behind Keith Winning. He coaches them, offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, Chris Skrotsky. There's nothing that uh, can replace experience. So I think more than anything, he's just gotten so many reps between last year and the first half of this year. So I think, uh, you know, when we first got here a year and a half ago, he knew the objective of his position was a lot of people talk about uh, knowing what the 11 guys on offense do. And he definitely has that part. But it's really important in our system that you understand what all 22 guys are doing. So not only what's happening on our side of the ball, but what's happening on the defense. And I think he is uh, seeing things a lot better, and I think every game it gets a little easier, and every practice it gets a little easier. And I attribute that mostly to, you know, he, he works his tail off and uh, the amount of repetitions he's got. I, I think he's taken more of a command from a, a leadership standpoint. You know, Keith has a lot of physical ability. Obviously, he's got good size and uh, good arm strength. Uh, he's, he's not the most outgoing, talkative guy, though, in the world. And I think he's made a concerted effort to uh, – take a little bit more of a uh, verbal role. He knows, you know, his, his peers selecting him as captain, and uh, I think he's taken that role seriously. So he's really done a great job. Uh, you know, he's always done a great job by example, but now it's, you know, starting to verbalize. And now it's time to choose our players to watch, and of course we're going to be watching Keith Winning to see if he's going to put up similar performances, but who else are you watching? I'm going to go Jonathan Newsom, a player who in four games has already got six sacks, causing a lot of pressure. He's going to need to do that again against the uh, Western Michigan quarterback. I mentioned the running back struggling uh, so far this, you know, through the last three games. Uh, I'm going to go with Jawan Edwards, my player to watch. In the Eastern Michigan game, he had 200 yards and three scores. The other two Matt games, just 52 yards a game, and he has zero touchdowns. So I think Jawan Edwards really needs to step up. And on the opposite end of that spectrum, who do you look for to improve? For me, I'm going to go with a guy that's probably been the most present surpri surprise this entire year in Willie Sneed, although last week, six catches, a little low for him. He had two or three drops. He and Wenning never got on track. Those two, for a prolific season, need to be back on track. And guys, I'm going to stick with the running backs. The first three games, they had 272 yards a game and eight touchdowns. The last three games, only 142 yards and three touchdowns. And Clemson was one of those teams in the first three games. And finally, keys to a Cardinal victory. For me, it's getting pressure on the quarterback. The biggest difference between Van Tubergen and Carter is that Van Tubergen has very little experience. Only five starts, you get pressure on him, you make him make mistakes. And I talked about it a little bit earlier, guys, the red zone offense. You have to score touchdowns in the MAC when you're in the red zone. Last week, three trips in the red zone, uh, inside the 10 yard line, only six total points. And like I just said, if in the MAC, so many points are scored in every single game. If you're gonna win games, you gotta score six instead of three. It should be a great game. Remember to listen to us on the radio. The three of us call the game on Sportslink Radio 91.3 WCRD. Kickoff is at three on Saturday for the homecoming game. And 
come on and support the Cardinals. They get a big win. They're back on track. And it's now time for our What's Chirping question of the week. Remember to tweet a question at us at Third Down Chirp or hashtag Tweet Pete for your chance to win a free pizza from Papa John's. Our question this week comes from at Sports Karma. Which of the remaining six teams in the schedule pose the biggest threat to Ball State getting a bowl bid? Well, first of all, one singular team is not going to knock Ball State out of a bowl game because even if they lose one game, they'll still have it four losses. You can go to a bowl game very easily at 8-4. and four. But the toughest team that Ball State has to face, in my opinion, is going to be Toledo. That team looks back on track, and it's on the road. Pat, I agree with you. Toledo is good. I think OU might just be a little bit better. I think playing Ohio University is going to be one of the biggest games left on the schedule. It's senior night, huge game. If they win that, I think they could finish 8-4. and four. Thank you for your question at Sports Karma. Remember, if your question did not get chosen this week, you can always have a chance next week. Just tweet a question at us at Third Down Trip or hashtag Tweet Pete for a chance to win a free pizza courtesy of Papa John's. And for the latest in Ball State sports news and stories, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Just search Ball State Sports Link. All right, prediction time. Timmy, you're starting to pull away in this prediction game. Pat, pressure's on. Who you got? I'm going to go with a lot of points. Shocker. Mac, a lot of points. 37-30. Ball State gets the win. You mentioned it earlier. They get back on track. And I'm going to use my strategy and go under Pat a little bit. That's why I'm winning. I go 34-28. to Ball State pulls it out. And who can argue with that logic? And uh, <laughs> remember, game kicks off at 3 o'clock. Listen to three of us, Sportslink Radio 91.3 WCRD. Come out and support your Cardinals. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of Third Down Chirp. Remember, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You can find us every week on Fox College Sports, Comcast Indiana, and WIPV TV. So until next week, for all of us at Sportslink, he's Timmy Fogarty. He's Pat Boylan. I'm Chris Renkel. We'll see you next week. Go Cardinals.